And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Welcome to the Midnight Ride. I am your host, David Carrico. We're so very honored that you're joining us for the ride this evening. Tonight, our broadcast is entitled The Mysterious Starforts of Tartaria and the Dragon Lairs Exposed. Tonight's broadcast is a follow up to a program we did just a few weeks ago on Tartaria, and tonight, I guarantee you, it's going to be an extremely compelling broadcast. And it's going to be so compelling, we're going to require for this broadcast that you secure yourself deep in your bunker and firmly strap yourself in because we are now live, live, live. What's up, David? Well, I'm excited about this show tonight. It's gonna, I mean, this is just off the hook. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be um, just showing some amazing things from the Word of God, from the prophecies in the Dead Sea Scrolls, from all kinds of research, from so many angles, and we're going to be tying it together in the Word of God to really just it's just amazing to me. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. I know that like this subject alone is is probably one of the most mysterious subjects that there is overall. There's no doubt about it. Um when you look into this stuff and you start looking, it's almost addictive at it how, is. how much you, when you look into it, you can just keep finding stuff and keep finding stuff. And there's been people that have done research on it quite a bit. And, uh, I want to make sure people understand what research means. Research means you're researching something out. Uh, we don't claim to have the corner on the subject whatsoever. We claim to be researching this and, uh, we definitely give credit to our sources, uh, for the ones that have, come before us in this and, and we're looking into it. Um, I feel like, you know, being able to put this with a biblical perspective, David is probably, uh, very important because it, it helps you understand history as a whole. And, and there's no doubt history has been, we've been lied to about our history. There's no doubt have. about that. All uh, we have. And this was a subject that I didn't even look into at all until her last broadcast. That's just been a few weeks ago. And I kind of thought, you know, you brought this up to me, and I kind of thought, well, you know, this is just going to be goofy. But there, and there's some goofiness in it, but it's it's something really at the bottom of this that's driving it. And it's like so many myths, and all myths, they have a basis of truth at the at the bottom of it so that's what we want to do as the book of proverbs say we want to search the matter out and find out what it means and of course we do that with the word of god and when the the word of god will teach us of all things and even of this marvelous topic as you're going to see there's some amazing truths that we're going to be bringing to bear on helping us understand the mystery of these star forts no doubt. And before we get started, I just want to sh give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, jo Joshua Watts Leather. And you can go to joshuawattsleather.com. He makes everything from bracelets to book bags to backpacks to Bible covers to book covers. And he does an awesome job, uh, especially if you're into it. I know I am. I've showed you guys this before on previous shows, but the covers that make it look like they're ancient books and just amazing books. He's made me a journal cover uh, that I'm going to give to my children one day. It's basically words of wisdom that I'm going to pass on to them one day, but it has our family crest on it, our family shield on it. And um, it's just, it's awesome. And I've got several Bible covers from him as well. 
David, you've got a Midnight Ride book bag that's pretty amazing. I love my book bag. Yeah. I love my Joshua Watts book bag. And I think Joshua could make about anything you want. Anything, yeah. And he yeah. loves doing custom work. So anything you guys can dream up, he can make. Uh, definitely go check him out, joshuawattsleather.com. And in the video down below in the description here, you'll see his link to there. And we also have another sponsor. Uh, which she we do we spo she sponsors us, but we give her the sponsorship for free because she's a widow, but she makes seat seats, which are very important, and she does a really good job. In fact, she's actually uh, this takes me to my next subject, which uh, is our Midnight Ride logo competition that some of you guys entered. And for those of you that I didn't get your picture in time, or you didn't send it to the right email. Or I just didn't, I looked over and didn't see it. I want to apologize big time because I tried to get every single one of them. I put them in a log. If I didn't see them, save them for the next one because we will be doing another limited edition after this one that you guys can get. And I'm going to show you guys the contest winners because the first place contest winner actually gets a, uh, let me pull this up real quick here, actually gets a t shirt with the logo on it that he designed, a hoodie and a coffee mug all for winning the contest which is awesome it's like a 70 dollars value so really really cool um and i know it's not you know the time and effort i'm sure that these guys put into putting these together here's the logo this is the winner with over 200 votes for the winner uh 200 and then we have two runners up so the two runners up, um, you guys are actually going to get something as well. So you've got second place and third place. You're going to get a set of seat seats from Kathy. And if you go to her website, it's the goldenspoolrules.com. And she made these seat seats specifically for the Midnight Ride because they're black and blue. Really, really sharp and cool looking. And I'm going to show you the second and third place contestant winners. The first place contestant winner is Jesse Valesquez. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And uh, the runner-up and the third place, these are the pictures for the runner-up and the third place. And I will be emailing you guys so I can get your address to send you the seat seats. And um, also, Jesse, uh, if you email me from the email that you sent me the logo on, I will send these, the shirts, uh, hoodie, the shirt, the hoodie, and the mug to you um, this week. So Monday, I'll be sending that out. So... Uh, it'll take a little while for it to get there. It takes a while to fulfill the order, but I will be getting it to you. I appreciate everybody that entered this competition. You guys did a great job. And for those of you that would like to get the limited edition uh, logo on anything, below here is there should be like a bar with a bunch of our T-shirts and stuff like that on there. And also in the link, you'll see uh, other gear on there. And it's a Teespring store where you can get that. So check that out. Thank you guys that support us. And David, let's get on the ride, man. Let's do it. And I just want to say a big thank you to everyone that entered the contest. There were a lot of really good logos. And I will say, too, my favorite one. So I'm very happy. But thank you all for uh, a lot of really good stuff. Yeah, for sure. All right. The Mysterious Star Forts of Tartaria and the Dragon Lairs Exposed. And for those of you that didn't see our previous broadcast, um, we have a map here that shows Tartaria. And this is very interesting. It's from the map of the travels of Marco Polo in 1261. And it shows Tartaria here. It says Independent Tartaria. And there were gobs of maps that showed this area that would extend um, all the way from the Ural Mountains all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Some of them went all the way even into North America. And we did our last show and we talked about the possibility that this was describing an antediluvian civilization and certainly it existed uh, until very recent times not that long ago at all lots of maps have this on there but we really explored a lot of fascinating theories and we really had a lot of great input from the listeners on that and i really enjoyed that first show john i was uh, it was my first introduction to tartaria 
and I kind of got hooked on it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it too. I mean, it was really interesting to look into because like you, I had never really looked into it nor really have heard, had heard of it, but um, there's been a ton of great researchers that came before us, but uh, being able to put it together in that form, uh, it's quickly become probably one of the most uh, popular Tartaria shows on the internet right now. And thankfully, that's great because it, it does put it in a perspective, I feel like, that uh, helps us understand history as well as biblical history. Yeah. So really, really good. And you're right about the maps. I mean, there's so many maps with Tartaria on it. It is, it is just unreal. Yeah. And this map here shows that it was more than just a name for a geographical region. It was an independent nation. And also in our last broadcast, we talked about the mud flood. And there are a lot of researchers and a lot of eyes that are looking at this topic, like John said, and a lot of really fascinating things that are coming out. And something here that we're going to present, I believe, for the first time ever, if I can safely say that, is a prophecy from Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls that is prophesying a future mud flood. Now, let and we're going to compare this with what the book of Revelation says. Now, let's take a look at this. This is amazing. And this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from hymns and poems. It's hymn number 10. Let's read. The torrents of Belly Isle shall reach to all sides of the world. In all their channels, a consuming fire shall destroy every tree, green and barren, on their banks. Under the end of their courses, it shall scourge with flames of fire and shall consume the foundations of the earth and the expanse of dry land. The bases of the mountains shall blaze, and the roots of the rocks shall turn to torrents of pitch. It shall devour as far as the great abyss. The torrents of Belly Isle shall break into Abaddon, and the deeps of the abyss shall groan amid the roar of heaving mud. What a phrase, the roar of heaving mud. Sounds kind of like a mud wow. flood, doesn't it? Yeah. The land shall cry out because of the calamity fallen upon the world, and all its deeps shall howl, and all those upon it shall rave and shall perish amid the great misfortune. For God shall sound his mighty voice, and his, his holy abode shall thunder with the truth of his glory. The heavenly host shall cry out, and the world's foundations shall stagger and sway. The war of the heavenly warriors shall scourge the earth, and it shall not end before the appointed destruction, which shall be forever and without compare. Now, that's heavy. <laughs> that's a, a heavy-duty prophecy there. And uh, what do you think about that, John, when you hear that? What is your, you know... My my, I, my mouth was open, you know, when I read that. I can't believe that um, that is a straight-up mud flood prophecy. There's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, apparently, you know, we read... You read a scripture in our last one of one that it talks about... Um, talks about a mud flood as well like a judgment that comes upon the land and i don't remember it was in that was in isaiah right correct isaiah? Uh, yes isaiah and i can't remember the i can't either the address on that but if you go back and watch the other one it talks about that but this is this is something that you know without context you wouldn't understand what it means uh but that yeah i mean that was mind-blowing no doubt about it i'm glad you found that i mean that's some, that's a jewel a jewel in there for sure now make a mental note of the torrents of pitch that's going to come in play in another very fascinating aspect toward the end of the broadcast and in prophecy we see cycles that repeat themselves and you'll see an event we had antoshus of Pipthanes. he was a type of the end time beast and then we had Nero and there were cycles that repeated themselves before we have the final beast and I think this is what's going on with the mud flood we see evidences of mud floods that a lot of people are bringing out 
But I'm coming to believe that these were the precursors to the big mud flood that this individual prophesied. Now, when we evaluate any literature, like here's a prophecy from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I think there's some things like this that are really right on from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's some stuff that's jacked up, you know, because they were there for a couple hundred years, and not all of the Essenes wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls material. They were librarians, so you can't just say it's all bad, or you can't say it's all good. You have to evaluate it. But when we take this prophecy and try it by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God, we get some amazing uh, insights when you compare this prophecy, which was written probably a couple hundred years before the book of Revelation, at least. And let's just look at some of the similarities with what we see in the Word of God. It talked in the prophecy of the trees being destroyed. Well, here in Revelation 8 and 7, it says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire, mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burnt up. And this is exactly what we had described in the Qumran prophecy. And what happens when you have a forest fire and the grass and the trees are destroyed? You get rains and you get a mud flood, mudslides, landslides. This is exactly what happens. But I'd never put that into this context in the book of Revelation. And it talks about the abyss opening unto Abaddon. And in Revelation 9, 1 and 2, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. And here we have a star, don't we? From heaven unto the earth and unto him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and as the smoke, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And in Revelation 9-11, we've got Abaddon. And what it looks like, uh, and this scripture it says, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. And in the prophecy from Qumran, it appears like there's this fire and there's this mud in a big river, and the earth opens up, and it goes down into the abyss, and for us that believe the biblical cosmology, that there are actual foundations underneath the earth, that it's it appears that this mud and this fire and all of this whatever it is, it, it goes down so deep through the earth that it actually damages the earth foundations. And it's interesting, and I don't, there's nothing in the text that I could really point to that I've seen uh, that it might be that, but if you have a nuclear reactor melt down, it gets so hot that it burns straight down. And it literally burns uh, a hole right down into the earth. So there might be something like that going on. Uh, we can't really say. But there's another in, in the text right after that. In the Qumran text, it talked about the heavenly warriors coming to the earth. And here in the book of Revelation... It says, and there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and we're going to see the dragon again here in a little bit, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And there's a scripture now, this next one, I'll never look at the same way again, uh, and after comparing the text in Qumran. That's when I get a witness of my spirit. When I see a prophecy that has, uh, it was written uh, a couple hundred years before the book of Revelation, we've got about a half a dozen clear-cut correlations with Revelation 9 through 12. And here in this text, it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And after comparing this with the text in Qumran, this could be talking about a future global 
cataclysmic mud flood that's going to take place in the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. And then in verse 16, it says, And the earth helped the woman, which is the end time remnant, the bride, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And we see this also in the text in the prophecy from Qumran that we see literally this mud going down uh, deep into the abyss and even down to the foundations of the earth. So there are some amazing uh, points of comparison here. And what I uh, thought about when I read this text was the phenomena of sinkholes. We're seeing sinkholes all over the world like yeah. never before, that people are talking about sinkholes all the time. Well, is the father preparing a defense for his remnant? And I think literally this could be talking about when this flood is coming after uh, through the earth that literally he's going to help us and open it up and let it go down a hole before it gets to us. I mean, it's amazing, but for us that are crazy enough to believe the Bible, this is exactly what this could be talking about. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's not definitely not out of the realm of, of. Uh, I mean, it's happened before. We see evidence of mud floods. This is going to be interesting too as we kind of get into that. But this is, um, there's so many theories too. You, you when you look at the theory of like Pangea, have you looked into that much or anything? You know, there's interesting stuff mm -hmm. uh, correlated with that, and there's interesting things that, like you said, sinkholes that are just popping up. I remember when I was a kid and I lived in Texas in my backyard, basically, uh, which is about three or 400 yards away. Thank goodness from our house, this huge sinkhole opened up. I mean, this thing was almost 50 yards across the sinkhole was and deep is who knows how deep it was. And I don't know what they ever did with it, but I remember being a kid and my mom telling us not to go anywhere near the sinkhole, but this thing was massive. And you see these videos of them open up in the street. You see them, uh, just random spots where the ground's just crumbling underneath people's feet and mountains are liquefying and crazy stuff it's not too hard to imagine what it'll be like in this final cataclysm that comes and just does something uh to wipe out these and in, in, in revelation it's talking about uh the judgment on babylon am i right is that yeah. what the judgment's talking about so yeah 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 so it's amazing i'll never look at that scripture just exactly the same and one final um passage from the hymns of Qumran. It says, as the abysses boil above the fountains of the waters, the towering waves and billows shall rage with the voice of their roaring. And as they rage, hell and Abaddon shall open and all the flying arrows of the pit shall send out their voice to the abyss and the gates of hell shall open on all the works of vanity. And that is very much... Uh, in line with what we've talked about on other shows about the restrainer being removed, Satan cast back in, and the end time of opening up of the abyss and the release of the devils. And there's a difference of opinion on that. There are some people that believe Satan's already been cast in. Now, I believe that's future. And you see, it's real important to know the biblical parameters there because for those that believe that Satan's already been cast in, you think that you're taking the devil's best shot now. But I don't believe that's the case. I think we're yet to see the full power of the evil one manifested. And in this final go-round of uh, the prophecy here from Qumran and from John's apocalypse is... Uh, uh, what's literally going to be happening. So it's very important that we are prepared for that which is to come. So we're going to begin blending in the topic of star forts with Tartaria. And this is a map of the world of star forts. And, uh, and on this website, which was very cool, you can actually click on all of these dots and it'll show you the actual star fort. And what a star fort is, is a fort shaped like a star. Very clever, huh? And what's a mate, you know, well, what, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is there are 
thousands of these things. And we're going to show you a few examples of these. And there are many of these that are very ancient. And there are thousands of them. And I, all of a sudden, someone figured out that there's all of these forts shaped like stars. And of course, why? Why is this? And we're going to be putting forth some very compelling scriptural theories tonight on why we see this. And here is a map of Europe. And there's a tremendous concentration of star forts in Europe. I know, John, you were telling me that uh, you were watching a video where they were showing a lot of old star forts that aren't even here anymore, thousands of them. Yeah, uh, they're, they're um, and it was Flat Earth British, I believe. I Actually, I have the link uh, description, or the link in the description to this guy, Flat Earth British, that was showing different sites. And there's another guy, too, and I can't, he's a, he's a Russian guy, and I can't think of his name right now. But the one I found that was interesting that kind of correlates with some stuff I'm going to bring up later was some places he found that you can still see the outline of these actual star forts um, in, in the layout of the land using Google Earth. You can see them plain as day. I mean, there's yeah. no mistaking that's exactly what they are. And he shows them by going through Google Earth. He types in the coordinates so you can go through himself. And, and once again, I want to let people know I'm not endorsing these people by any means, but if you're wanting to look up information on these kinds of things. I don't know everything that this guy teaches whatsoever, uh, but when it comes to this topic, he has a lot of interesting information on that topic. And uh, in the same way, I might uh, give a reference to an awesome doctor or a math teacher or something like that to one of my friends. It's the same kind of reference. Now, spiritually, I'm not, I'm not giving a reference to this guy whatsoever because yeah. I have no clue what he believes but i did see this video that he put out that was uh very compelling uh, and, and there's no compelling about it it's just that's what it is it is you can see it there's no wondering if that's what they are and you can see that they're all covered by mud uh by the way so interesting and we do always want to give credit where credit is due for the work and the labors that these men and women have done and we make no bones about it. We're the Bible bangers. We're the ones that are going to look at it through the lens of Scripture. And that's when things get really, really interesting. Now, we're going to show some of these star forts, and they're stunning. And also, I want to give a big thank you to Sister Donna, who did a tremendous amount of work and research on the slides, and also to Brother Jimmy Cooper. We're going to be showing some video later. Brother Jimmy helped us to edit so a big thank you to Brother Jimmy. But this is Palmanova in northeastern Italy. And this is just stunning. And these shapes and designs that we're going to be showing you, uh, many of these were in sh the shape of a pentagram. And some of the hexagram, the six-pointed star. And some of the octagon. And the star shapes many times were uh, blended together. And just fascinating, but these are just visually stunning. Here's one of Fort Boutrang in the Netherlands. And this was built all the way back in 1593. And many of these go back to the Templars and the Knights of Malta. We're going to be showing you uh, one of the Knights of Malta star forts. And this is another picture of Fort Boutrang. And this is just stunning. And they would enter... They would be shaped in the star configurations. You see a five-pointed star in the center, and there's hexagrams, octagons, and there's moats, and just amazing, intricate star fort designs. And um, many of these go back to the times of the Templars, Knights of Malta, some are much older. And um, this is Fort St. Elmo, and uh, this is a Knights of Malta star fort. And... Uh, just amazing uh, the size and the scope of these and uh, this is the uh, this fort here is the fort of St. Elmo the design that you can see here and it says the actual fort was built on the design of Pietro Padro Knights of Malta built Fort St. Elmo at the entrance of the Grand Harbor in order to protect the entrance of the natural harbor and the Order's great fleet in it, Fort St. Elmo was built at the tip of Sabaris Peninsula, 
where Malta's capital city, Valletta, is now located. Now, 1552, the date on that plan. Now, here's my theory, and it has to remain a theory, but I think it's a pretty good one. We know that the Freemasons were called the Builders, and that the speculative Freemasons or excuse me, the operative Freemasons, which existed before 1717, after the Grand Lodge of England was formed in 1717, they were called speculative Freemasonry, and then someone that an actual, then an actual builder could then join. But the Knights Templars were the builders, and we have every reason to believe that the Knights Templar and the Knights Malta possessed antediluvian knowledge that has been passed down. And I believe that what we're seeing here in the design of these star forts is an impulse that comes from a worldwide antediluvian civilization. And we're going to be seeing some compelling evidence that would point us in that direction. Any thoughts you have on that, John, before we roll on? I am thoughtless right now. My brain's my brain's uh, looking at these things. This is these are interesting. Um, you know, I, there like you said, it has to be theories. But there's so many ideas on what these could be, what, how they were made, what they're for, what they do. There's so many things running through my brain right now, and there has been this whole time as to the the reason uh, for these things and the, and if they align with constellations. I mean, it look like when you look at the map that we saw earlier i'm going to pan it back to the one you had up here this uh, slide that donna put up here this right here and you see how many there are on the star forts in europe just in europe it makes you wonder if anybody's ever and there may have been if somebody if you guys know of anybody that's actually tried to line these up with constellations or whatnot um please let us know or lined up with ley lines or what or whatever uh, I'd like to know about that because this is this is crazy. This is like you said, we're jumping in new water here. No, I don't think anybody out, out of everybody that I've listened to, a lot of people have theories, but I don't know. You know, obviously we don't know for sure what the underlying reason for these things are. At least I don't. Um, you know, I don't pretend to know, but I mean, it's just we and you were talking about it on the way here. All the different things they could be the reason they were there how they were built you know it's just it's mind-blowing really i mean yeah. and, and there's no record of it and why they're built um that i know of and that's that's even more mind-blowing to me that there's these amazing things all over the whole in whole earth and nobody uh knows and and writes about why they're here now i could be wrong you know i'm sure somebody will pop up you're an idiot. You should know that they wrote them in this book in the 1540s. And I'm not an idiot. Written I'm in Russian or whatever. Well, I don't know. I don't speak Russian. And if you have the books, send it my way. You know, it's all good. I will look at it. I'm not claiming to know it all. Neither is David. So let's, he'll hear it out. Yeah. yeah. And we, we don't know specifically what the reason is, but we know there is a reason why. Because there are thousands of these star forts that have existed over the period of thousands of years. Yeah. So there is a reason for it. And I believe that that reason goes all the way back to an impulse that comes from the antediluvian world and the antediluvian builders. Now, here's another picture of St. Elmo, this Knights of Malta star fort. And the car there gives you a little perspective on the size of these walls. They're massive. Uh, you know, this is a massive fortification here. And here's one, uh, Charles Fort in Kinsale, Ireland. And uh, they're just visually beautiful for weapons of destruction. Um, here's one in America. There's a lot of them up in New York State, uh, Fort McHenry. And uh, it was uh, very famous in the War of 1812. It says, American Star Fort McHenry, constructed in 1798, is best known for its role in the War of 1812, successfully defended Baltimore Harbor from an attack by the British Navy 
used continuously by the U.S. Armed Forces through World War I and became a national monument in 1939. Here is one, uh, Nardine in the Holland Netherlands. And just again, a stunning visual of um, this aerial shot of this star fort. Here's one in uh, Fort Ontario, New York. And uh, here we see the five-pointed star. And say we see the five-pointed star, six-pointed star, and a lot of the stars. And um, we're going to see that uh, there are some scriptural theories on why this is and some very solid ones. And we're going to go to scripture and we're going to begin to read some texts that will bring to bear some ideas that could give us some possible theories why this is. And here is the first war ever recorded in Scripture. This is the real World War I. And it takes place in Genesis chapter 14, and it's the War of the Five Kings. And after the Tower of Babel, we see a realignment of the Nephilim stronghold from Babylon to the land of Canaan. And this war results as there is a rebellion on the part of these Nephilim that were relocating in the uh, area of Canaan. But let's read the text. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Shedleramer, king of Elam, and title king of nations, that these made war with Bera king of Sodom, and with Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinbab of king of Adma, and Shimber king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt C. Twelve years they served Chedlaramer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. Now, what I want you to notice here is the alignment of the five. And when the Nephilim constructed their defenses, they did it around five points. And here we see the five kings. And this is a repeated pattern that we can see right within Scripture. This five point, and I believe that this habit of the Nephilim, that this is the basic impulse that goes all the way back to the pre-antediluvian world, that they set their defenses on this five points. Now, it says, and in the fourteenth year came Shedleramer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtoreth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the, the Amims in Shaveth, Kuriatham, and the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Now, this is quite a story, and in what's described here would be uh, probably wilder than some of these scenes from the Lord of the Rings, where we have these battles and we have the giants and the trolls and everything fighting together. This is not uh, far-fetched. This could have even be wilder than that. And here's one of the words here, the Horites, and we talked about them before, but that's in the Hebrew 2752, and that is from the root that means cave dweller or troglodyte. There are troglodytes, these little cave trolls that are talked about in Scripture. And this is a part of the, the result of the inbreeding of the Nephilim into the in lineage of Esau, which is called Seir. And we've talked about this in previous shows. And when it says the Ashtoreth Karna and here is also the Strong's reference on that. And what that literally means is Ashtoreth Karnachim, Ashtoreth of the double horns, a symbol of the deity. Now, when the two horns, and this is why 
the bull was worshipped because of the two horns. This is why the uh, Mithras was worshipped as the bull. And the planet Venus, which in Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Halel ben Shahar is also a designation of the planet Venus. And when the ancients tracked the movement of the planet Venus across the sky, the star chart made a helmet with horns on it. And this was the original reason why the worship of the horns. And there are many uh, statues of the Virgin Mary that you can see the horns at the base on. And, you know, this is just a symbol of the goddess worship. And what this tells us is that these Rephaims, which is another word for giants, Nephilim and Rephaim, the, the two most prominent words translated as giant in the Hebrew scriptures, that they were goddess worshipers. And this is going to also play a huge role as we begin to unpack the symbolism of Tartaria and how it might have connected with the star forts. Now, we're going to start analyzing the Tartaria tablets. And this is something that is, again, just tremendously fascinating. Some people believe, uh, scholars claim, many of them, that this is the oldest writing that's ever been found. And we're going to go to a uh, drawing of this just so for the purpose that we can get a little better look at what's going on here. Now, in the one to the left, when you see a circle with a cross inside of it. Albert Churchwood, in his book, The uh, Origin and Evolution of Freemasonry, he was a Masonic symbolist, and he said that the symbol inside, or the cross inside of a circle, he says this is the sign of the station or dwelling, or we could say the sign of the sanctuary or the fort. Now, also, when we see the round ball on top of the cross, this is a designation of the planet Venus. So here is a big connection in this Tartaria tablet of, of people that study ancient symbols. It connects it with the planet Venus and goddess worship, and which was the worship of Lucifer in Isaiah 14 and 12. And we'll see that all paganism, it relates to the worship of the male and female genitalia and of the host of heaven. That's what paganism is when you get down to the bottom line. And all of these pagan deities were worshipped as star gods. And this is one of the big reasons why that pagan people, they tried to reestablish contact with these fallen star gods. So we have some real symbolical connections and the Ashtoreth of the two horns. And we can see two horns in the one on the bottom right. We see two horns on the top left. And we'll get an interpretation here by a scholar. And um, we also have the um, website, Pegasus Research, I believe, is the website we took this from. We have the citation there at the bottom. And here's the interpretation of the possible meaning that they gave to it. It says, The objects found in a sacrificial burial pit at Tartaria, western Romania, and inscribed plaques, the upper one showing two animals, which could very possibly be goats. And here again with the goat, we've got a big connection with the goat of Mendez and all the way back to the satyr and the goat gods uh, that are in scripture. And, and a tree suggesting a sacrifice in celebration of the return of new life. And in paganism and in the mystery religions, it was the worship of the dying God. Osiris in Egypt was the dying God, and the birth and the resurrection of these gods were celebrated at the spring equinox 
and at the summer solstice and at the winter solstice, which is separated, celebrated uh, very blasphemously as the Easter and the Christmas celebrations of the evangelical church. And shame on you. Uh, but in Freemasonry, Hiram Abiff is the dying god. When you're initiated into the third degree of Freemasonry, the the Mason plays the candidate of Hiram Abiff, and they tap him on the head with the setting maul, and he falls back, and they catch him in a canvas, and sometimes in Grand Orient Freemasonry, they'll put him in a coffin, and then the worshipful master comes along and raises him from the dead with the strong grip of the lion's paw. And this is what is meant when a Freemason talks about, I was raised in this lodge or that lodge. It doesn't mean they grew up there, but that means this is where they received the strong grip of the lion paw. And this is possibly, and the date given on this, and this is the date that is given by the scholars, and we know we got to take that with a grain of salt, but by anyone's opinion, this is old, possibly the oldest writing ever discovered. And the date here is 5300 to 5000 BC. And this date here, this puts it, uh, we're talking about antediluvian here. So now we've got symbolism and documentation that is opening up theories that is connecting us here with the antediluvian world. Now, a little more information on this find in Tartaria, and we're going to show you the bones of Lady Tartaria. And you can see the old girl isn't doing too good uh, because we're talking about, uh, according to their estimates, uh, over 5,000 B.C. But this is the remains, of, and they know it was a woman. They can just determine that. And they can look at the other items that were found with her, a lot of clay idols, that she was more than likely some kind of a goddess priestess figure. And this is another big connection with the goddess worship, obviously, that connects with the religion of the Nephilim that we see all the way back to the 14th chapter of Genesis of the worship of the Ashtaroth of the two horns. And... Here is a figurine, and this also was worn uh, down tremendously from the thousands of years, but this is believed, it says here, an idol found at Tartaria in a ritual pit. The Tartaria priestess, shaman woman, or dignitary woman, Milady Tartaria, limped on her right leg since her since her youth because of her thicker ank loosed and shorter right femur and leg she had a posture forming an arrow the artifacts were part of a funerary inventory of a woman 50 to 55 years old tartaria milady along with 26 burnt clay idols two alabaster salotic tools a spondyl husk seashell bracelet and this is probably the oldest documented evidence of pagan religion we have and it comes from Tartaria and it perfectly agrees with what we see in scripture of the worship of the goddess and the worship of the star gods it's interesting too, and a lot of the uh, which I'll show here in a little bit. I don't well, I won't show that part of it, but I'll I'll give a link to where I found it. But in the book that I was looking at, there was a lot of uh, look like Muslim symbolism. You have the moon, the crescent moon. Had did you have you noticed that in yes, any of I your have. in your stuff? Yes, That's I have. really yeah. interesting. And you can see that on the Tartaria tablet. Yeah, you know that, uh, and also that goes that in goes along under goddess worship. Sure, yeah, they worship the moon goddess at the Kaaba before the days of Muhammad. Yeah, and it kind of goes along with what you're talking about, Mercury, because the horns, and the interesting thing about the Muslim symbol, it's all, it's a crescent moon kind of facing a different way than you'd normally, uh, if I remember right, I could be wrong, but it's facing, the symbols I saw were facing up like this on top of a pole, 
And uh, the CIA document that I read before was talking about it being a Muslim company, company or a uh, Muslim country. But you see that that uh, crescent moon, like if you if you can imagine this roll of toilet papers as a pole, you can see the crescent moon going like this on the top of it. And it's interesting because that totally plays into the two horns. That could be possibly another interpretation of that. So yeah, and. When we understand that ancient peoples communicated through symbols and that these symbols of the two horns, it meant the same thing to many people in many different countries over thousands of years. And there are many different languages and amidst all of these languages, there are many symbols that are consistently interpreted across the board. And it's through analyzing these symbols that we can begin to make connections between the different cultures and different periods of time. And then, of course, we take it to the Word of God and we get a perspective that begins to make sense. And the more we look into this, the more pointers we have, most definitely, that we're looking at something that originated here from the fallen from the fallen ones that the star forts were originally from the fallen angels and we're going to begin to look at now some things that would connect the star forts with technology and we're going to show you a video here and um, I think it was Friday night about three in the morning uh, or maybe Thursday night about three in the morning Brother Jimmy Cooper and Sister Donna were working on this, and it's some really amazing stuff. And we're going to show you some mind blowing connections. So, John, let's just look at this. Um, I'm going to scoot around here so I can see it. This video clip for you. All right, let me put my headphones on here too. So, we and can I want to say that uh, this is from a gentleman by the name of Nigel Atoxic, a or A T O X I C. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but. Uh, Kudos to you for this because it's pretty mind blowing. Yep, here we go. Let me turn the mic on here. It probably helps so people can hear it. Normally, I mean, you know, many people have seen oscilloscopes in the laboratories, right? Here's an oscilloscope. There is at all. No big deal, right? We've seen them many times. But he's doing something quite unusual in the oscilloscope. He's getting the oscilloscopes to produce three dimensional. Um, visually, they look like three-dimensional structures. Now, I found this fascinating. I'm just going to click through the video here to show you the type of thing that was happening. And I found this fascinating. But I believe the saying is, I nearly dropped my lunch when I saw this happen. Now, the, the tones you're hearing in the background, if you were to play that tone, folks, the oscilloscope set up the same way. This is a bog standard oscilloscope. You can buy any oscilloscope in the junk shop, right? Set it up. He tells you how to set the settings and then just play this sound and this will appear on the oscilloscope, oscilloscope screen. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think this has something to do with Star Force and why it's important in a moment. Here we go. We are about to see the structure of star force. Boom. Start to emanate from the sound and the frequency on the screen. Can you see it? Do you see what I'm seeing? Is this not bizarre? I think there might be another clip too. Oh, you want me to play the next one too? Yeah, the okay. first. Let's play the first two clips. All right. Normally, I mean, you know, many people have seen oscilloscopes in the laboratories, right? Here's an oscilloscope. There is at all. No big deal, right? We've seen them many times. But he's doing something quite unusual in the oscilloscope. He's getting the oscilloscopes. To okay, produce that's the same clip. Three-dimensional. I may not have the uh, um, right video. I do I put the two videos to see what slide do you have? There is another video. Let's see. Is this it right no, here? Let's keep looking. This is it. Yeah, this is it. There you All go. Right. Can you 
Can you see the structures I'm seeing with the star forts that I pointed out to you earlier in Antwerp? Around Antwerp, was that not the shape of the star forts around Antwerp? Or something? I mean, I'm trying to pause on the right at the right moment here. Uh, is anybody seeing this? I mean, like, let me know what you think here, folks. See the way, you know, as the wave collapses and as it moves and as it shifts, I'm wondering, well, here's what I wondered. I wondered because I've looked at these star forts and I've thought, all right, well, there you got it. Now, uh, we just have to file this under, oh my gosh, amazing. And, you know, the fact that there are thousands of these star forts that have existed for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years with we don't know why but here we see this symbolism being reproduced with a sound now what makes it even more compelling something that is commonly reported um, with Marian apparitions is a hum and a buzz at the apparitions of Medjugorje the the visions of the the three children or was that Fatima I don't want to get uh, confused but it was Fatima I believe that they heard the buzz uh, it was where they appeared to the three children I believe that was Fatima correct me if I'm wrong but many UFO abductees also report hearing a buzz in a home now also in scripture another one of the tribes of giants is called the Zamzuman and just like the word implies Zamzuman, it means those that buzz. And there's something about the sound and the vibration that is at the root of this star force, uh, star fort issue. I mean, what do you make of that, John? I don't know, but you know, it brings me to a story in the scripture about Jericho when they were going and they were circling the fort. And they're blowing their trumpets and eventually the walls came down and it reminds me of that because we know that obviously the world was created with words right with a voice with yeah. with a mute with a, a sound and um you know it talks about in the sound the voice of god being like a rumbling thunder when he speaks and, and you can't help but imagine that this is this could be a lot of the reason like we talked about the fasces in that one show that these weird looking weapons that they yeah. would bring into war possibly creating some kind of sound resonance that caused mud floods or something we who knows but man definitely profound stuff crazy look you know they they're shaped exactly like these star forts i mean there's no mistaking that for sure yeah and in the the story you brought up of the Battle of Jericho, which wasn't much of a battle. They just blew horns. And there was a vibration coming out of that God-anointed shofar. And there was quite possibly from that fort a energy coming out. And when God's energy met the energy vibrations of the evil kingdom, boom, they fell down. Yeah. So there are things here that we don't know all what it is, but we know the miracles of God. And at the base of these miracles of God, there are the mysterious way in which he performs them. And the, the vibrational aspect of this, and of course now, modern technology, they are going uh, full bore developing these energy beams and these sound weapons. And we've done a lot of shows about the role of vibrations and microwave weapons and the targeting of individuals through this technology it's becoming a huge thing and a huge issue and it all goes back to the very root of this fallen angel technology which i believe we see here in this symbolism of the star fort now let's consider this also from scripture in daniel chapter 11 verse 38 and the scripture says here, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew, 
knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strong holes with a strange God. And these star forts look like they might be the most strong hole, mightn't they? And in the translator notes of the King James Bible, the it says forces or munitions, the Hebrew mazuim, or God's protectors. And this is the concept that was taught in the satanic doctrine of Kabbalah and Gnosticism that you can summon these angels in the second heaven and they will be your protectors. And it's interesting that this word, and you can look it up in the Strong's, it's the Hebrew 4581, and this is what you'll find of this word, the God of forces in Daniel 11:38. It means a fortified place, defense, force, Fort. So we have a Hebrew word that can mean a fort or a force. And we have this fort reproduced in the images of the force of the sound in the oscilloscope. Now, it's hard for me to write this off as just a coinkydink. You know, I don't believe in coinkydinks. And we've got too many of them here that are pointing to the fallen ones as the origin of this whole thing and all of this symbolism. Now, it gets even more compelling. And uh, we'll get up here to this um, slide here of the still shot of the Ouroboros. And it's kind of wild the way Sister Donna come on to this. And we were working with this video and looking at it, and she just happened to freeze it at this uh, particular point. And we said, wow, this is the aura Boris. This is the snake swallowing its tail. And it's amazing that we can see this here right in the center of this. And it looks more like a dragon than a snake. It looks like a, a dragon with its spines. And we've already heard uh, scriptures that talk about the dragon. But it, in these uh, sounds that show us the sign of the star fort, we also come up with this amazing symbology. Now, for the Ouroboros, is something we talked about on several shows. We've showed the Seal of Solomon, which is the symbolism that Eliphas Levi used uh, of the hexagram inside the circle. And like I said, we the hexagram and the six and the five pointed scar, the hexagram and the pentagram, they are very, very frequently used in occult symbolism. And here again, we have something that is another mystery. Why is the star associated with the Ouroboros, which are both produced in this sound frequency that forms these symbols of the star fort. Now we'll read this text here for uh, some of our newer listeners that haven't heard about the Ouroboros. The Ouroboros or Euroboros is an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. Originating in ancient Egypt iconography, the Ouroboros entered Western tradition via Greek magical tradition and was adopted as a symbol in Gnosticism and Hermeticism and most notably in alchemy. And this is the stuff of Kabbalah and Gnosticism. It's an occult symbol. And in, in this next one, here we see the bringing together, and there are many examples. We've shown before the Seal of Solomon, which Eliphas Levi drew. It had the snake swallowing its tail with the hexagram inside of it. And he blasphemously described that as the Holy Spirit. And if that isn't blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, I don't know what you'd have to do to qualify. This is also quoted in Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma and also in Bridge to Light by Rex Hutchins that 
This is the meaning of the Ouroboros around the hexagram that was drawn by Elithus Levi. It's rank blasphemous, blasphemy, if anything ever is. And here in this symbol, we see this dragon, and it looks here like a, our friend the cockatrice there is getting in on the act, and it's swallowing its own tail and surrounding the five-pointed star. Now, we saw both of these symbols produced in these images from the sound waves. Now, is it possible that these symbols were originally drawn because of the worship and the frequencies that were taking place in these star forts? And just like the these symbols, why did people start doing this using these symbols? Well, we don't know, but it's quite possibly, I believe, that this is um, the original impulse. I mean, and, and look also, we have the, um, the circle with the horns on it too, right there in the middle. We have three points of similarity in this one occult symbol with these images we saw from the oscilloscope. Now, what's up? Yeah, what, do you, what can you make of that? Because, you know, it's, it's crazy too, you know, in music, when, when you play music at a certain hertz that can have a better frequency for your body to hear, or if you play it at a different, like the recording industry now, they've changed the, the uh, hertz that you hear music at, the different uh, range or whatever. And I'm not sure exactly how it works. I've done, we've done a show about it, talked about it before, but um, it went from, according to the people that have studied these frequencies out, went from like a healing frequency to a frequency that is not, I don't know, they say neutral, but it seems to do on, on water and on plants and stuff actually more harm due to the way that the music's recorded. And uh, when you think of, you know, Lucifer was made with strings, or when I say Lucifer, I guess the, the, uh, the cherub, that was called Lucifer, I guess, in the, in the King James Version. What would the, the name? Anointed Chair the, the Anointed Chair that covereth. Anointed Chair that covereth. Twenty eight. Yes, it's, and it, he had strings attached. I mean, he was literally a music machine yeah. that was made. You see this stuff, and then you see the the um, positive aspects of of sound in the Scripture. Obviously, with um, you know the 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 trumpet, you know, is used as a war instrument in the heavens to to war. To use as yeah. war, which is an amazing thing, and I think a lot of times people don't understand why we blow the trumpets and why we do some of the things we do. But these are these are real life things. Sound means more than a lot of things, even just the way we speak. The Bible says that you know if you can tame your tongue, you've tamed your whole body, and your mouth is like a rudder. And anything that you speak, you can speak life or you can speak death. And there's verses and verses and verses about that. And there's even science which I don't really care about the science of it, but there is science to back it up. You know, they had these kids that were talking to this one plant and they were telling it, you're ugly, you're brown, you're, you're wilted and all these things. And the other plant, they were like, man, you're, this is a beautiful plant. You're beautiful. All these, they're just the words they were saying. And at the end of the time when they got done with it, which I think it was a week's time, I could be wrong, but you can look it up. The one that they were speaking negatively to was wilted. And the one that we're speaking positive to was beautiful. And it reminds me of Yeshua in the, the fig tree when he, he pointed at it and cursed it and the tree just wilted. And we have, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit inside of us. People need to really remember that sounds and, and music. And that's why I don't listen to like crazy music anymore. I used to listen to this crazy music that would just, it really <laughs> just kind of fills it. you with rage. Yeah, the, mu the lyrics might be great or whatever, but the, the music can really do a different, had put difference in your body. It can really change. And yeah. something I was going to say real quick was, I wonder when you're talking about these symbols and like this this uh, um, serpent in its tail and this hexagram in yoga and the in the yoga when they when they do these sounds they create like a om sound that yeah. they do which is really yeah. interesting that's supposed to summon this energy or whatnot and and the lady that we talked about before Rama Downey the lady that did the Bible series which is a new ager big time she's yeah. a light worker yeah. she has a magazine called Om but there's definitely the the dark side's tapping into this so I think. It's very important that we tap into this stuff with blowing the trumpets and speaking life and speaking good things as well and and beautiful music and, and stuff, pouring that into our own heart. So it's important to have that counter balance in that and what it would be considered the positive, you know, the, the holy side of things versus the, the wicked side of things. Because this is obviously, when you look at this and you say, 
you have the cockatrice, which most people probably have no idea what that is. But can you explain that real quick and what that what that is, so people can know what what that uh, serpent mixed with like a chicken type bean thing is? Yeah. People have no idea what that is or what that means. Most people are looking at that, and and the people that you say that to, they they're like, what does that mean? So yeah, a lot of people believe that the cockatrice is. Um, just an imaginary fairy tale, but it's in scripture. And the cockatrice was an animal that the legends say, if it looks on you, it will kill you. And if you look the cockatrice in the eye, you'll die. And that it also would admit poison. And uh, many people were killed by these uh, cockatrices. And we've done some shows on it. And it's deeply fascinating, the study of the scriptures on the cockatrice. And uh, you can look those up on Now You See TV and also on FOJC. And they were very real. And like all of these things, they're not fairy tales, but they're looking back to a time when the world, the antediluvian world, and also after that, when we had uh, dwarfs, we had giants, we had animals that were hybrids in a world that uh, Harry Potter didn't have a thing on and these Lord of the Rings shows. They're based on reality of what scripture uh, describes. And uh, here we have this symbolism. And you know, when you have um, that many points of similarities, uh, you're just beyond the um, realm of uh, coincidence and here we see the word abyss and it goes on and on and on but you know also yeah, one, one thing too real quick before i, okay, before right I blow, lose my mind the cockatrice and the symbolism for tartaria are very similar i know it's, yeah. it's supposed to be a griffin but that's to me that's the same thing when i see that symbol it looks like a dragon it with a very cockatrice yeah. on yeah. it sure did and also you know on this thought you know in the hebrew scriptures we have the ironic blessing yeah. And we have the power to bless. Yeah. And then there was Balaam, uh, who was the sorcerer. He could use his words to bless or curse. That's right. And it's very important that we speak blessings. And all, and now there are sound weapons that are being used by the military. And there are energy weapons that can kill you. Yeah, 5G, I mean, 5G coming up. That's yeah, a scary thing. And, uh, I mean, I know they've had it in California for a while, but there's been some crazy reports from people that they're going, they're hearing voices. Yeah, they're yeah. hearing, you know, things are, cancers are being developed, crazy stuff. No. Anyway, you guys did a whole show about that at oh, one yeah, point. Oh, yeah, we've done several shows about the 5G and um, uh, a lot of shows. We did another show on FOJC with Julia Thompson Oh, just last week, and it's a it's we're seeing the return of the fallen angel technology, and there's nothing new under the sun. And when we analyze the symbolism and the things behind it, uh, there's a big finger here pointing to the fallen ones. <laughs> yeah, it's them. Yeah. yeah. Now, at this point, we have another. You know, that it just keeps blowing my mind. But John has got a a, a portion here. Uh, on oh, yeah. the dragon and John just lay it on us. This is just absolutely mind blowing. All right. I will do that. This is, I'm not going to take up too much of the time, but I want to kind of go into this, what I found here. So I, I looked up, there's a couple, there's a couple uh, videos that I looked up and I, I, I can't take credit for some of the information in this, but you guys can go to the description in the bottom of the video uh, here, like if you're watching on YouTube, like down down here, there's a description. One of them's for one of Flat Earth British's things where he kind of talks about this book a little. And there's another guy that talks about this book. But I saw something really interesting here that I want to share with you guys because um, it, it just is it's cool. So we'll check it out real quick. So this is a book here. And this is called La, Gal La, Galleria, La Gallery Agreeable. And basically what that means is like the agreeable... Uh, gallery of the world so this guy is a merchant that went through and he mapped these areas uh, did a really fantastic job of mapping these areas out and wrote about the areas that he went to this was considered a atlas of its time something that the government would have used uh, this was written in French 
And so I want to I want you guys to see this really quick, quick here. And you can download, you can go to get this book PDF. I got a link to the PDF for this book. You can look at all this yourself. I just kind of screenshotted some of this stuff. So this is actually in the book here, David. Do you see anything interesting in this symbolism here? You have um, the the deity in the back, uh, and I can't uh, Atlantis or uh, Atlas, where he's got the and this is in the Greek they would call him Atlas. But you, yeah, come over here and check it out because this is interesting stuff here. Um, you have holding this the world on his back right here in the back in this mountain, and you have these two angels here to the left that are one of this guy has like what looks like a uh, like a snow globe with people inside of it, kings and stuff, and this looks like almost like another angel here holding it. And you have this globe in the background, then you have this representation of this world with like this you know energy field passing through it. You have the square and compass on the bottom you have um all kinds of random stuff in this there picture a circle with the cross in it too yeah you have all this stuff and this is in the very first page of this book here that you guys can see if you look it up so there's interesting symbolism in there i didn't know what to make out of it all but you also have the ships in the background and so this next one right here is a passage from the first page here of actual writing and uh it's translated here on google google uh translate uh, or Google, yeah, Google Translator, and we'll translate it real quick. I'm going to go through this pretty fast here. So the, here's the translation here, and in this translation it says, the inhabitants of the region call it Polska, a name that derives from the Arctic Pole. Others from the world were Pole, which is, and, I, and I'm reading this as tiny print for me, so forgive me for stuttering through this, which in and Klavon means a common country or raft. Poland is comprised only of a country, valleys, and large forests because there are few mountains which make the coast of Hungary and small Poland. And this is the next ses section here. And so uh, this is just on Google Translate here. So it says Krakow is a capital, but is the capital of the whole kingdom. It is a big, beautiful, rich, and well-populated city. It's double walls and very strong castle built on rock make a vigorous defense. It's named after its founder, Krako, prince of the country who built it in the year 700. And, and this seems to imply that it's 700 uh, AD, so 700, which is not that long ago, really, in the whole scheme of things. And here's the next section that was really, really interesting that I saw this guy was pointing out. This talks about the dragon here. Okay, so it says here, and this is just that passage translated into here, it is in this church where worship never ceases that the kings of Poland usually limit themselves and bury. There they keep the king's royal crown and marks. We see, we see you, and, and of course this translation isn't perfect because this is ancient French here, and so it's going to be probably somebody else to be able to translate it better than Google Translate, but I don't speak French either, unfortunately. So we see you, this path to the cave where the angry dragon withdrew once, which made terrible devastation in outlying places. It is said that King Krako killed this monster, preferring a meat dish full of mortar and sulfur, which is really interesting uh, because, David, as you, if you want to read that passage, there's a passage in, um, and this is the town, and so all this outlying area outside of this town would be what this dragon was kind of destroying, which is crazy because if you think about uh, I didn't, many of you guys may not have seen the Hobbit series, um, and I usually watch some of these movies just because I can, like, I want to look at it and see what it tells. Because the Lord of the Rings and stuff, this is based on um, a genealogy map done by uh, a genealogist, the Thirty Thirty Degree Freemason, and the um, director of antiquities for Scott and Alexander Lawrence. Right? Is that his name, Alexander Lawrence? Lawrence Gardner. Lawrence Gardner. Alexander yeah, Lawrence, Lawrence is a Gardner. friend of mine, different yeah. guy. Okay. <laughs> Lawrence Gardner, and he um, he maps out this stuff, and he's been a genealogist for a while. So the Lord of the Rings is actually played off of his genealogies of the dragon kings, the, the dragon queens, and the, the elf kings, and all these different things. But anyway, in The Hobbit, there is an exact representation of this story here. There's a dragon that goes into a cave. Right, and it's guarding this gold, the gold that the dwarves had hoarded up in this cave. But it, when they make it mad, it flies out and destroys all the outer line town and area like that. Now, uh, they didn't kill it the same way, I don't think, but it's really interesting. And, and there's a scripture uh, that I feel like if this is a real story, they probably got their idea of destroying this dragon from Daniel. So, da David, if you want to read that real quick. Yeah, and I got a feeling 
that story's real, and I know this story's real. Yes. Now yes. let's have a midnight ride instant replay here, and let's go back to the original prophecy we read at the beginning of the broadcast from Qumran. This is what it says. Uh, it says, The bases of the mountains shall blaze, and the roots and, and the roots of the rocks shall turn to torrents of pitch. Now we're going to see pitch. Pitch and mortar are, are the same thing. I would imagine yeah. they used pitch probably back then to do their stuff and so when you say pitch and of course like I said this isn't a perfect translation anyway so that's interesting the mortar part anyways go ahead it is very interesting we see these points of similarities repeating and this is from a book called the history of the destruction of Bell and the dragon and this was originally in the King James Bible uh, it is uh, what would be called a King James Apocrypha and this is what of uh, Bell and the Dragon in verse 27 says, this is how Daniel in this story kills the dragon. It says, then Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair and did seed them together and made lumps thereof. This he put in the dragon's mouth and so the dragon burst in sunder and Daniel said, lo, these are the gods you worship. Now, the point of similarity is undeniable. It mm. sounds to me like maybe somebody back there said, I think the Bible might be real. I think we'll try this. Yeah, they <laughs> took know? notes on Daniel's wisdom and, and decided to kill it in that way. And, you know, when, when we think about these kind of entities right now, it's like, in, in especially in America, you know, we have this sense of supernatural is probably so... Um, veiled right now and especially in the United States we have this world around us that's designed to to pull our attention and of course there's some people that have tapped into the supernatural and they they live in that in that manner in that form and they understand we are uh, supernatural beings you know as well as flesh beings we have a supernatural side there is a yeah. spirit realm there's all these things but a lot of people haven't tapped into that yet and there's but people in other parts of the world they still are haunted by a lot of these demons, which we know. Um, and and just to put this in terms that somebody that has never understood this might understand. In Genesis 6, it said there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after, when the sons of God, which were angelic beings, came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And so when we have like the heroes, and we have the Greek gods, and, the, and all these different gods, and of ancient times these were the mighty men men of renown and the word nephilim means giant and we have these giants that roam the earth and the book of enoch which i believe fully to be scripture um the first book of enoch and that's important to make that distinction it says that when the giants died their bot they became disembodied spirits that roamed the earth forever and so we have these little towns where these heroes that were of old are still worshipped to this day because they, if they don't go out and sacrifice something or they don't go out and do this, that spirit torments their town to this day in some of these towns. And uh, America, is, the spirit realm has started to become more real because um, we have different areas in this in this place that are just straight up portals. I mean, you like places like Sedona and L.A., the city of what I call the city of fallen angels. We have these these things starting to show themselves more in our country, and they've always been here. I mean, this is known as the land of the plume dragon, so we know that this is here. But um, we've been so blinded by the light, so blinded by the the paparazzi, blinded by media, blinded by whatever, that we don't tend to see the spiritual side of things in the stuff that we consume, yeah. you know. And but this is a very real thing, and I forgot where I was going with this, but. Um, I'll just leave it there since I don't know where I was going with my conversation. What was I? Gonna, what was I talking about? We're talking about giants, anyways. Let me let me just finish this up real quick, and then I'll show, and then I'll shut up here. So this is uh, this is like the map of this area, and you guys can go check this stuff out for yourself. But there's different places that you can see these star forts. This is one. Uh, this is another, and some of these are in Moscow. Some of these are in. Um, Ukraine and different areas, but you see these things and they're when you zoom in you can zoom in really far They're really well drawn out like this is not these they're not grainy whatsoever And uh, that's that's pretty much it for, for what I had on that and I can't remember where I was going with that I do that all the time I'll start talking 
completely lose track of my original point. But anyways, maybe David, maybe you remember what we were talking well, about. Well, good job. And uh, you had a lot of good stuff in there, John, and just deeply fascinating. And uh, get your questions ready for Sister Donna. Well, we're going to be bringing her on in a few minutes. How many minutes do we have for questions, John? We have about six minutes. So, like, we could pretty much kind of just go to them or we could kind of – I just – one thing that I that I would lo- – I want to make sure that people understand is that um, I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert on anything. In fact, the more I learn about things, the more I realize that I do not know uh, unfortunately, especially when it comes to ancient history and history, what I do know is that I believe that I believe the Bible to be a hundred percent true. I believe that the history inside of it is true and it can be proven. There's towns that people didn't believe exist that were talked about in the Bible, which they found these towns later after uncovering them to see that they were actually there. There are historical events that we've proven that oh, not I haven't proven, but they've been proven to happen. Uh, we know that in in my life personally that this the God of the Bible the true the, what I believe to be the true and holy righteous King has revealed Himself to me. I believe this to be true. Um, now, when it comes to actually looking into history, looking into the stuff, we don't know everything yet, uh, but we can find these clues in the Scripture. I just want to make sure that people understand that I don't look at myself as a um, as an, as an expert in this there's people that are uh, very smart that talk about these things uh, I am a researcher which means I just research out things that are already there um, I'm not an archaeologist I don't go dig things up I don't do a lot of this stuff but um, I just I thank you guys for listening for sure and I know that this is one thing I want to say real quick I did this on the last show and the last show whoever had the highest amount of likes in the last video Send me an email. I'm looking at your uh, your name right now. Send me an email, and I will send you that mug because I was in the in the comment section. Whoever had the most likes on their comment gets a mug. Also, this video may not get a lot of traction on YouTube. A lot of our stuff is suppressed. We have over 130,000 subscribers, and right now there's only like 1,100 people watching, almost 1,200 people watching, which means that less than 10% of the people that listen to the show are actually aware that this show is either going or they can't listen or whatever. So on the count of three, there's two at the right here, there's a like button, like button, and there's a dislike button. And on the count of three, we're going to do this together one more time. We're going to smash the like button or the dislike button. If you don't like it, one, two, three, Bam! Smash that button. So thank you guys, and congratulations to the top comment. You guys get a mug, so make sure you email me about that. So Now, there's a few things I want to go through quickly before we bring on Sister Donna. There's still there's a couple really neat things. 1 Samuel 6, And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was in it, wherein the jewels of the gold were, and put them on a great stone, and the men of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five, count them, five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day, and these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord for Ashdod one, Gaza one, for Ascalon one, Gath one, and Ekron one. Genesis 14, we saw the five Nephilim kings. Here in Samuel, we see the five lords of the Philistines, their five cities, and within that uh, encampment, what was produced? The Nephilim giant, Goliath. He was the first super soldier, well, not the first super soldier, but he was a super soldier. Uh, and there went out a champion of out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So we got 666 in there. He was six cubits in a span high. His spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. There are six pieces of armor. So we have the giant 
with 666 all over him produced within this five city alignment. Now, this is a Masonic Lodge Hall, and we see every Masonic Lodge is set up like a star fort. Who would have thought it? And there's the blazing, uh, there's the payment. It says they call it the mosaic payment. Don't blame Moses for that. The mosaic pavement is an old symbol of the order. It is met with in the earliest rituals, and you see there, Freemasonry is famous for its black and white squares that represent Luciferian dualism, and there we see the star right in the middle. And here's another picture of it where we see the uh, two five-pointed stars, super, one superimposed over the other, in the middle of the pavement with the uh, black and white squares. Here's also something fascinating. We have the star shapes in the uh, city of Washington, D.C. There are many of them that are obvious just to uh, casual observation, and this was uh, designed by La Infant, uh, the Freemason. So here again we have more connections, and you can connect the dots uh, in Washington, D.C. and uh, the landmarks, and you get a very definitive uh, pentagram with the two points up, which is defined in black magic as something that works the dark rituals of the left-hand path. This is unmistakable. So we can see that our capital city is Masonic in design, and it bears the signature of the star fort. And look at this. Have you ever, uh, you know, I will never look at the Statue of Liberty in the same way. Here we see in the Statue of Liberty, also designed by a Freemason, we see the goddess and there at the base is the star fort. Coincidence? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. It's just amazing. And um, We are in the District of Columbia and this is definitely... Yeah. The Colombian Columbia right there on top of the star fort. This is interesting. Yeah, and look at that base. That base is the design of the star forts. So there we got the goddess and the star fort over and over and over. So uh, with that, that's going to conclude this part of her presentation, and it's time to bring on Sister Donna. Sister Donna, are you in the house? Sorry yeah. again, Donna. I forgot. I had you muted. There we go. Now we got you. Okay. Yes, I am in the house. Literally, I am in our apartment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Allie's question is, um, is there any possible connection between Tataria and the legend of Atlantis? If so, how would that relate to the new Atlantis legend of the elite? Yeah, and... The story of Atlantis is the story of the, the, the civilization that was destroyed. And not only is there the legend of Atlantis, there's also the legend of Mu in the Pacific of a civilization that was buried under the Pacific Ocean. And this is what we have in Tartaria. It's an ancient civilization that perished. We know it was there. We don't know all what happened to it. There's a mystery about Tartaria in our time that is very compelling. And the indicators that point us to the antediluvian world uh, back to 5000 plus BC uh, shows that we're talking about a civilization that once existed and has mysteriously vanished. So there's a lot of points of similarity with the Atlantis story that are just very compelling about uh, directly relating uh, Tartaria to Atlantis. What do you think, John? I, I mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, it's very, very possible, and I know that a lot of New Agers or people that um, the Great White Brotherhood and, and people along those lines that, I mean, even it just depends on what religion you want to call it. I mean, it goes back to theosophy in a way or uh, Great White Brotherhood theology or even just uh, even the Hopis kind of believe this, but... Lemurians, a lot of people believe they might be associated with the Lemurians, perhaps, which is a um, 
basically a made up word for the civilization before the uh Atlanteans, you know, it's the the um, you know, so they were basically a higher spiritual being according to them. Um, which we did a whole show about the Great White Brotherhood and the seven root races. They so there's a lot that can be said about that and a lot of theory about it, but I think you know, biblically I think it's very clear that there was antediluvian um a civilization that may have even existed um post flood as well you know with the and in, in my opinion and i think you know, we just as an opinion but it seems to be the descendants of japheth that actually went there and um set up their towns in that area um and we see a lot of his descendants in that spot now a lot of people would disagree with me on that but i think uh when when you call philippi the philippines i think that there's a big uh problem with that theory that japheth settled in the philippines i think that you know looking at um the civilizations and and what that means i think that that's um i don't think it's possible i i and i could give reasons but um that and i guess that's way off topic of the question um once again i would agree with you on that yeah yeah so we got a lot of documentation yeah for the lineage of japheth settling in that area yeah josephus and other yeah. historians that are rock solid for yeah I so mean, we got a lot of historical support when, when you look at like his name first off his son's name you know um Meshek, which a lot of scholars believe that's where the term where moscow came from and then you got his son uh c-h-a-n khan where we believe a lot of people believe that's where the name genghis khan came from and you know one of his grandsons so i mean there's a lot of real evidence there i mean there's it's not just like one thing there's like like you said, there's a lot of historians that would agree with that, oh, and, yeah. and there's very few evidence that it was in the Philippines uh, where this was, and, and I, so I think that's, anyways, that's, who knows, I, I'm an idiot sometimes, so, but, you know, take it for what it's worth, but look at the evidence for yourself and see what you come up with, so I know that there's going to be people that are slamming this after the fact and saying this is impossible and that and this and that, but look at the evidence yourself, I mean, see you know, don't take our word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Look it up and, and check it out. So yeah, the record of ancient history is overwhelmingly on our side there. Yeah. Okay. Next question is actually for John and David. You're moving a little bit away from the mic, honey. Okay. Um, it's getting slower and okay. slower away from the mic there. Yeah, the longer <laughs> the show goes, the farther away he gets. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth wanted to know. Uh, she said she's not finding anywhere on your site to purchase products with the logos. Okay, so if you go down here below the video, maybe I can do a screen share here. I don't know. Just go to the YouTube video and look below. Like, there's going to be a. Um, let me see if I can do a screen share real quick, guys. I'm. I'm unversed in this i haven't done it in a long time i do a lot of other stuff with this and hopefully this doesn't play music okay so let me figure this out here now i'm not seeing it in this live video either okay if you go down below where the description is you'll see like buy in iuc tv merchandise there and so there's a lot and actually in the description it says other gear and it's got a link and you can you can see the see it on there and so you can go check it out from there i don't we don't have it on the website yet i i i tell you what there's one thing if it's not one thing it's another uh to do but it is there i promise you if you go to teespring to check out nys tv where type in midnight ride nys tv you should be able to find it in the google or in the search on teespring uh but it's there so anyways uh hopefully it is anyway if it's not let me know but i i'm pretty sure it is i put it there right before the show came up so okay Ali's next question is the five-pointed star is often interchangeable with the pentagram in the occult such as Wicca could it be said that the US Pentagon building is a star fort as well and I do apologize I thought about that but I did not get that picture in the slides yeah I'll try it next time yeah that's the um, probably the mother of star forts right now obviously the uh, Pentagon yeah, and mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we give, um, I mean, there are thousands of these things, thousands, and the Pentagon is a classic example. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Okay, and Allie, she's always full of questions. She has great questions. Um, if the stars are angels, 
Um, could it be that star forts are monuments or functional temples to the gods, fallen ones, that ruled the antediluvian world and the way pyramids align with the stars in the sky? Could it be the as above, so below thing? Monuments to the fallen counterparts to the heavenly angels? Sorry, I was talking to David. I don't know if you... <laughs> We're using some of those We're... symbols for communication yeah. here, not uh, Illuminati hand signals. I don't. No one thinking we're using Illuminati hand signals, but we're having a little uh, sign language. But uh, I do believe that this question relates to the relationship of a connection of the star forts with the constellations and uh, as above, so below. And that's a conversation we were having driving up here, John, about the um, connection with constellations and ley lines. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, there's definitely a connection there. I mean, there's no doubt that they've been pulling power from this uh, stuff. And Tesla had the, you know, he's one of the more modern people that had this knowledge of this. Uh, but I think it's real, I mean, to me, it's pretty apparent that that's what these things were. I mean, yeah. it has to be. And... Uh, of course, they had a more pure form of technology than what we have, at least in my opinion. You know, when you see some of the stuff that they've done, it's how how else can they have done it? You know, and, and if you think about, which I believe this, and I know David does too, technology, uh, a lot of the technology that we have comes from uh, fallen entities or the uh, what it calls the sons of God in the book of Enoch. It talks about them giving us technology. And their technology was a better, more pure form. And if you look at the way technology is going, just to kind of quickly sum up my idea on this, right now we have things like this microphone, for instance, these headphones that leave a carbon footprint after we're gone. The more technology increases, the smaller these things become, the less you're going to need these because they're going to be able to implant things and chip and you're going to have cameras for your eyes. You're going to have uh, virtual reality. So the imprint that they would leave carbon wise or or i guess they call it carbon footprint but uh, the pollution or the the uh, artifacts that you're going to find are not going to be as numerous as they are now because we're not yet to that level of technology that they were at you know where whereas now we need huge machinery to lift and build we use huge metal they probably, you know, looking at some of this stuff now, I feel like they probably use sound to levitate these things or giants or whatever to make these things, build these things and make these beautiful um, buildings and, and shape them properly. And, and um, so, yeah, uh, I guess in a roundabout way, yeah. That yeah, the point, big, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the areas that is going to be one of my next big veins of research is ley lines and coordinating the star forts uh, with ley lines. And theoretically, tonight we have theorized that the star fort could have been um, an energy, some kind of a energy generator for communications, energy, or weaponry. Well, could it be that the ley lines were originally set up as a line between two star forts is this why they were sensing energy between lines mm. very theoretically possible yeah. but this is something that we're going to be working on uh, to really get see if we can get some definitive correlations here because i'm certain they exist yeah i'm certain they do I'm and sure also they are. we'll probably find some verses in scripture that'll also say with constellations yeah. yeah oh yeah we're gonna we're our eyes are open to that. We're going to be looking for it. We think we can come up with some amazing stuff there because I know it exists. Yeah, once you see, like, the mud flood stuff that you brought up, like, you know, that's something that before we would have just crossed right over and never saw. Wouldn't have thought a thing about it. Yeah, and so I'm sure that there's things to do with with that. Uh, I, I mean, I'm positive. The Bible, in my opinion, has all the answers we're looking for. We just got to know where to look, God. so... It, you, you can really begin to appreciate what the Apostle John said, that the Holy Spirit teaches us of all things, even of Tartaria and the mud flood. Yep. And on that subject of the energy, I had a question, and I mentioned this to David as we were doing it. This 
this topic is, you wouldn't think it'd have this much involved, but there are just so many different avenues that you can go down just connected with this. But as I was looking at these, I was asking David, do you think there's these vibrations could be connected to the creation of crop circles? And uh, JD had some info on that that he put in the chat. And so evidently there probably is, but uh, we haven't had a chance to research all that yet. And I did. Um, when you just look at them pictures, that's one of the things that come into my mind. These are shapes you see in crop circles. So this is just another. Uh, there is so much that I think this is the point of origin of it. When we're, we're thinking about these um, antediluvian uh, energy forts or star forts, whatever you want to call them, that so much of what we're seeing here is the return of this fallen angel technology being produced by humans and also coming from the supernatural realm. And um, very, I think there's definitely, it's just visually, you see crop circle shapes in these oscilloscope images. And Ali's next question is, um, is there um, something to why so many nations, including America, have stars in their flags? Yeah, um, you know, and this is another commonality that you see among so many nations and it could very well be for the same reason. Okay, and how about this one? Um, Heliel, Satan, was once the chief heavenly musician, so couldn't he be the chief architect of the star forts because of the shape those frequencies make? And could the Freemasons know this? And that's why they worship the chief architect. Well, John was talking earlier in Ezekiel 28, where it talks about the anointed cherub that covereth. Um, and literally this fallen cherubim in Ezekiel 28, it's like his body is described as a musical instrument. It's like he's a living musical instrument. So this definitely points to the fallen world using sound and um, a pretty good pointer in that direction. Well, I've often commented before, maybe not necessarily on this program, but I, I love music, as most people know, and I think that music is the closest thing to being God, because it's created out of nothing. It's created fresh in so many different aspects of it. Uh, music is very important to the Lord, but it's also very close to Him, yeah. and the ability to create. Yeah. And God is the creator, created music, and inspires godly men and women to create music. And of course, Satan is the imitator and the perverter. He can't create anything. He can just defile and destroy. So this is even um, more insight into the satanic motivation here. Yeah, we were just amazed by what there were was being shown with the oscilloscope. I mean, that was just really wild. And of course, we've seen, um, somebody posted an image in the chat, but we had seen this before uh, with sand, where they put vibration to sand and how it mm -hmm. shows these different images. And also, when you think about snowflakes, they're all individual. They come out individual. They're all different. Each snowflake is different. So so much more to think about and we will be doing a future program on vibration eventually here we've been researching gathering different things we just haven't put it all together yet okay Ali's question another one is have you heard of the guy who's been proven to shrink cancer cells totally curing cancer and all kinds of other ailments with sound at first I thought it was some sort of pagan witch doctor but maybe there's a scriptural or godly way to do the same thing and I believe she's talking about the Rife uh, person mm -hmm. that made the Rife machine. I have heard about that. And um, there are lines that people go across that they should not cross. But you also cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
to say that you cannot legitimately use sound as a healing device. And um, I really don't know enough to authoritatively speak to that. Do you, uh, are you familiar with the details of that? I mean, I've heard about it, but uh, to, to speak on it with any kind of um, wisdom or, or knowledge, I, I couldn't do that. But I have heard of it, and it sounds right. intriguing. That'd be great if oh, that's true. Is. And I, I don't am... totally discount it at all, you know. I'm semi-knowledgeable about the subject because I did research it. And according to what I found, in order for the Rife machine to be effective, it involves both feeling, um, you know, touching the instrument plus sound. It used to have, has to be used in connection. There's all kinds of Rife frequencies on YouTube. You can listen to all kinds that claim to heal different things. But I'm not sure all those are effective because, as I said, I believe in order for it to work properly, it has to be a combination. Um, okay, back to our subject tonight. Uh, Brenda had a question. So what do the star forts mean? When were they actually created? Like during Tartaria? What about all the huge structures worldwide that do not make sense and where uh, some are submerged? Well, I believe as we have said, that we're looking at an antediluvian origin, or even possibly some things that go back to pre-Adamite. But I believe that there was a worldwide antediluvian civilization that had travel all over the earth, that had communications, that was ever bit as sophisticated as our civilization now or even more so and they did things that we can't reproduce now and the structures you alluded to that are all over the earth that um, you see things uh, thousands of feet up in the mountains in South America made with huge boulders that you know people you know we have no way in the world to figure out how to do something like that now and uh, there are other things like at Baalbek that just can't be duplicated. So I think that this is the originating uh, impulse of what we're seeing the remnants of. That this is from uh, the memoirs of a antediluvian civilization. And also there are a lot of things that we have talked about. The Tablets of Hermes and the pillars of Enoch that in Masonic ritual and in occult lore that they claim that these pillars transmitted the antediluvian knowledge to the post-flood world and I think that this is indeed accurate and did take place right. so I, and right. in yeah. this is the the real origin of the star fort from the antediluvian fallen civilization Okay, sorry, David, I couldn't hear you. Um, whenever um, I hear about these things, I often think about the scripture that, uh, I'll paraphrase it, where it says, with much knowledge comes sorrow. And I, I think uh, our Lord is sorrow because we get all this knowledge that involves different things about the world, but they don't have knowledge of the Word of God. And that yeah. that really brings sorrow for the Lord, I believe. Yeah, uh, We can have all kinds of other knowledge, but they're omitting what's most important. Okay, um, Joe had a question. Do you think that all of this information coming out right now in regards to the Star Fort and the mud flood is happenstance, or do you think all this information is coming out at this time as a sign that the end times are near? Because the Bible does say that in the end times, knowledge will be at its peak. I think it absolutely is a part of the revelation of end time knowledge and just as we have been motivated to look into it we have found some serious indicators that are pointing us back to the fallen ones and the antediluvian world so this is reaffirming and another confirmation that we are at the end of time and we're seeing um, just like Jesus said it's going to be as in the days of Noah 
And that means more than just giants. It means uh, a reproduction of that technology and civilization that was there in the days of Noah. And I think this is a part of it. I think it undeniably is. And and just, just to zip back just for a second on the Rife machine, because uh, Scotty posted something in the chat, and it's very true. We need to be careful about these methods of healing. Just because it sounds new or maybe if, it, if it's an old thing, just be very careful and yeah. pray. Yeah. You know, we're not promoting this machine no. at all, just like John no. said about I, um, some of the things we posted. We don't know for sure about these people and where they are with the God, but as our research goes, we have to get it from where we can find it at, and this is where it leads us to different websites and sure. and uh, YouTube videos. But So just be careful and always pray with whatever method of healing that you decide to use. Yeah, and the same uh, is true in herbs or anything you got to really check it out and yeah. we're not giving it a thumbs up or a thumbs down check it out you know check it out and see okay carla wanted to know is the u.s pentagon potentially based on star fort structures it looks very interesting viewed from above i wonder if they are connected and of course like i said i apologize i didn't get that picture in there but yes i believe that it is uh, the purpose for that and also on this, I don't want people to get the misunderstanding about this because these pictures that we found, a lot of these have been restored. They were, you know, crumbling structures, but they've been restored back to their glory, so to speak. So, it, um, and I don't know if they're constructing new star forts now. That was a question that um, I didn't even get to, to research for that. So, but it's a possibility that they might still be making them. Um, we don't know for sure what their purpose was. There's some people that say they were not built for defense. And then other people say, oh, yes, they were. You could see how they would be used for in defense in war just because of the structure. And like the high walls that we, sh we showed in one of the pictures, you, you could see how that would connect. But um, there's usually more than one purpose for these things. And that's what we've been trying to point out tonight. Um, we have one more um, question from Brenda. Yep, and why did they completely hide the history of Tartaria from us? Well. Maybe so we could do a program about it. Yeah, <laughs> but I have a scripture that I want to read. Um, also, from uh, this is from Isaiah chapter 14 and I believe that well I don't believe I know that we discussed this on our first Tartaria broadcast and um, I'll find the text here in just a moment do you have anything to say on that John while I'm finding this it might take me just a second well I know that um According to the document that we found on the CIA website, uh, they covered it up because um, it didn't fit the um, narrative that they wanted it to fit. Um, according to that document, I mean, you know, other than that, it was kind of vague. They didn't, they didn't want people to know how great the empire was. Um, you know, it's. There's a lot of reasons it could be, but I think the scripture that David uh, is going to read gives us an idea of the judgment uh, that they uh, had to come under. Uh, but, I mean, other than that, I couldn't tell you 100%. I mean, I don't think anybody knows for sure. There might be somebody that knows for sure, obviously, but I don't know. Uh, but I do know that they said that they basically wanted to cover the narrative and cover their tracks in history about it uh, because it was a pretty uh, huge empire, obviously. It was covered almost all the north and even possibly North America, according to some maps. So, um, yeah. And this is the text. And just for the record, um, I do not believe that, that Lucifer and Satan are the same entity. And for a complete teaching on that, uh, there's Lucifer, the son of Satan on Now You See TV, and also on our YouTube site. Just so you know, he's not saying that he 
is on this channel. We did a teaching about Lucifer, the son of Satan. It sounded like you said that no, Lucifer, the son no, of Satan. Lucifer's not. He's not. Goodness, he's not here doing a show or anything like that. He's he's definitely uh, he's not a not part on of our now team. You see TV giving <laughs> hand signs or anything, you know, nothing like that. But that was a good one, though. By the way, it was a classic, and uh, it started a lot of discussion, and many people have come to be believe that it's true, and. Also on our YouTube channel, uh, FOJC Radio YouTube, we have many teachings on that where we've addressed this topic. So, And also, I, there's no scripture that says that Lucifer and Satan are the same entity. And there's also nothing that says that the entity in Ezekiel 28, he is the anointed cherub that covereth. We could show from Scripture Satan is a seraphim, and we have a cherubim. So when we all when we say that well Lucifer the anointed cherub it's all Satan, when we get into the intricacies of the the Scriptures, these theories don't hold up, and they they hide some truth from us. But anyway, that's another subject. But let's go to Isaiah chapter fourteen, and this is the chapter that addresses the fall of Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, as verse 12 states. And regarding Lucifer in verse 20, it says, Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evil doers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise or possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. And scripture speaks of the seed of Lucifer being destroyed. And we read the scripture in our first Tartaria broadcast and theorized that quite possibly the reason why Tartaria is gone and we don't know what happened to it is it could be the seed of Lucifer, as Scripture says, they were destroyed and would not be renowned or remembered. So there's the a very plausible explanation. And you know, people, there's things that you know people don't have any explanations for, but in Scripture, there's a very plausible explanation that once again connects us to the antediluvian wall world of the Watchers. And you know, there's a real, I you know, a good, interesting idea that when Satan loosed, will bring the armies of the north back again to fight against Israel. Uh, it's interesting that we're starting to learn about this North Kingdom. Yeah. Now. Yeah. And um, there's something to do, with, something there, you know, for yeah. sure. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's. I think it's no coincidence for sure that we're that things are starting to bust off now about it. I mean, this yeah. is becoming a popular topic, and I think yeah. it's important to put the uh, possibly correct narrative to it to what it actually could be. I mean, it could be a people. There's a lot of people that are like in worshiping Tartaria. I mean, I, there's a Facebook group that I I'm a part of where the people just like they if their Tartarans were there they would be they'd be holding their jock strap up for them they love them so much you know? and so we have to create this narrative we have to see figure out what the truth about it is is it good or is it bad or is it were they wicked were they whatever i mean we can't just automatically think because they were possibly more advanced than us that they were uh better people in any way shape or form obviously they're gone uh for some reason or another so yeah and we're going to stick to the Word of God. We're not going to be a Tartarian hokey weirdo, you know, because <laughs> you just don't want to go there. Yeah. And, you know, as we close out the program, I just want to remind you all about a uh, couple things. Our uh, Passover celebrations are coming up. And if you go to our website and go to the ministry news uh, page, you'll find out what we're going to do for Passover. And also I have a link under our message to John's uh, link to his Passover celebration. We're each doing a little bit different things here, but um, the news for that is there. And we just have a few spots left for people to, to register if they want to come to ours. It's one Sunday evening 
uh, type thing. Yeah, I uh, think so we only got a few places left too. I don't even know how. Like we weren't smart about it. We didn't make people register, so I have no idea how many people are coming. So <laughs> that could get exciting. It could get exciting. <laughs> Just show up if you can, I guess, and hopefully we'll find a place for you. And, and if you you know show up to David's and them too while you're in town, you might as well do both. It'll be a good time and uh, good to hang out. Yeah. David and them can't make it to ours. It's a little bit far out for David, and David's far out for us. So we kind of did one that we could get everybody together if they wanted to come and, and uh, do it that yeah. way. But it's, it'll be yeah, good. The, the facility was just a little tedious for Sister Donna to negotiate. And we are, in our situation, it's just a matter of room. So if you want to be there, we want you to be there, but you're going to have to register um, to make sure that we have a place for you. That's the, the reason. But no charge. It's absolutely free. It's just the um, space accommodations that is an issue. So with that, and it is an exciting time, you know, to look forward to Passover. I mean, it's um, probably, I don't know, one of the most blessed times of the year. It's a very special time. Um where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. And what's more blessed than that? So yeah. we're really looking forward to it. And um, just a blessing. Celebrate God's times. Yeah. Special thank you to our moderators in the chat. You guys kept it very civil. The people in the chat were great, too. I mean, I was watching it during the during the question and answer a lot of really um, awesome conversation going on. So that's good because you don't see that in a lot of chats. Uh, really good stuff. Um, you know, I just want to say thank you to David. You know, it's always a blessing doing a show with you, David. Uh, blessing knowing you. We have great conversations, and I know I've learned a lot just by knowing you and being able to have the conversations and do these shows. Um, Donna, thank you as well, Donna, for everything you do in helping mm -hmm. David because I know David is technologically – uh, not there. So you you, you 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 get him on track with his powerpoints. You get him on track online. So we couldn't do it without Donna for sure. And um, really, just everybody that listens and supports what we do. You know, go to FOJC Radio, subscribe as well. Subscribe to this channel. Uh, hit the bell. You know, click the reminders when you need to. Um, you know, who knows how much longer we'll be there? We had a Midnight Ride backup channel and. Uh, it's not there anymore for those of you that don't know it's not there they got rid of it didn't give us a real reason they said that it uh, violated their standards and they booted it off and it was nothing but midnight right episodes so make sure to keep track we have an app too uh, which is a, a hopefully a way that you guys can kind of keep up with us i just uploaded the, or upgraded the broadband or the uh I want to say broadband, but that's not bandwidth. the word. Bandwidth. I am, there you see, you I'm not totally. You're not that. See, there I'm give, answering technological <laughs> questions for you, John. How can you say I'm technologically challenged? Okay. Look at that. Okay. Well, you're not technologically challenged. You got no, it. I so really band, am. bandwidth, we upgraded that. We have 4,000 people that have downloaded the app. You can check out podcasts so you can listen without uh, worrying about You can put it in phone in your pocket. Listen. We're, gonna, we're trying to update it to where it has YouTube Live on there. And that way in the future, if we do somehow get booted you'll be able to go and, and check out our live videos there on the app and uh, we're trying to add new features to it every day uh, to get it up to par with what we want it to be and so we're thankful for right now the father's given us an opportunity youtube's given us an opportunity and we're thankful for it even though they do uh, i feel like suppress some of our stuff we're still thankful because we're in a day and age now to where uh, 1, 1,200 people were watching our live show on YouTube, you know, where, where else are you going to have something like that? And, uh, we pray, we, I, I pray for their leaders there because, um, they're going through a time right now to where they're trying to get rid of anything that doesn't fit their narrative. So we pray that the father impresses their heart because he has control of the man's heart, a woman's heart, which in this case, Susan, he has control of that. He can shift it however he wants. So we yes, need to pray man. for that, that he shifts this because, there's a narrative being pushed in the world right now that is wicked. You know, it's going. We're having all kinds of horrible things that are being pushed in front of our eyes, and um, so rather than bashing them, putting them down, let's pray for them for sure. And um, there, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And most definitely, pray that God gives us favor, and uh, we serve the all-powerful living God. And we want to thank 
our listeners, as John asked, for sharing the video because it's very important um, in getting the information out because we are um, doing everything we can do to get out the truth. So with that, um, a big thank you to John and um, Now You See TV. And when I say that every time I get the honor of doing a midnight ride um, here in the studio with John, I am thankful, and I mean that. I am thankful every opportunity I have to share the gospel. And um, I, you know, and just a big thank you to all of our listeners. You're great. You're partnering, partnering with us in sharing the truth of the gospel with the world. Thank you so much. We we just mean that from the bottom of our heart. So with that, it is time for the midnight ride. High five. High five and good night, everybody. We will see you next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, on the midnight ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up.